will be offered by Shane Bowler. And then after the opening prayer, we'll have a special musical number by Brother Alpine Bowler, or Bol Bowler, Bowler, Bowler. <laughs> um, and then uh, following Brother Bowler's musical number, we will hear from our speakers, Chris and Marilyn Epson. Father, I wish to thank you this evening for Jesus and thank you for healing that surely comes through Jesus and ask for tonight thy love to be felt by those who are here and open to it and that that feeling will change the way we see our relationships with you and our perspective on our relationship with you. When we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Thanks, Alpine. So he's just one of our six amazing grandchildren. <laughs> and they're all talented, and we're, we're proud of every one of them. Um, before we get started, there's, there's a number of friends and neighbors and relatives that we've invited tonight, and we're so glad you're here. You're here because we love you. And, and it's been like, a, you're all like our family. Yes, and we're just excited to be here with you tonight. We appreciate you coming on a Sunday night. Um, there's a picture over here that I brought that sits on the wall just inside the front door of our house. And it's a reminder that the Savior will always come after us. No matter how far we think we can run or how fast we think we can run from him, he's always, he's always right there. He's chasing us. So as you'll hear in our story, if you haven't heard our story before, uh, many of you have. In fact, some of you might be bored with it. <laughs> That's okay. Um, that sheep was me. Okay, so let me begin with why we share our story. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Chris. I'm Marilyn. <laughs> forgot, <laughs> forgot the most important part. So let me begin by by telling you why we share our story. We live the motto of the podcast, Unashamed Unafraid. Unashamed about sexual addiction recovery and unafraid to come unto Christ for healing. We've shared our story in Firesides, Fifth Sunday Meetings, many podcasts with bishoprics, stake presidencies, ward councils, and many, many 12-step meetings and other church groups, as well as with our dear friends and many of our neighbors. And I began writing a blog about four years ago. Why? Why be so open and honest about a subject that is so often surrounded by shame and by fear and the whispered, we don't talk about this? Why do we get so excited about opportunities like this one tonight? because we do need to talk about this. Sexual addiction must be talked about because there are so many of our brothers and sisters suffering with it. One morning during the last week or so in, in rehab, I had a very vivid dream where I was standing in front of a group of fathers and sons and I was telling them my story. And it was so emotional for me. Uh, I woke up and there were tears coming down my cheeks and uh, my pillow was wet. I knew I had a story to be told, but I had no idea what was in store for me or for us as a couple. So here we are, we're excited to share a Reader's Digest version, if you will, of our story and then talk about some recovery principles lessons and experiences we've learned along the way the last seven years. As our facilitator, Brian, who is sitting over here, said, we recover loudly so others don't suffer in silence. Friday night, December 10th, 2016, Chris did not come home from work. He called me that afternoon telling me he'd be working late, which really wasn't that unusual. We had argued the night before about the lights not working on the Christmas tree, and he left for work early Friday morning. When he didn't show up that night, I began to panic. Along with our children, Adam and Kristen, we discovered he'd withdrawn thousands of dollars from our savings account. We thought maybe he'd been kidnapped. His phone was going to voicemail and we didn't know where he was or what had happened. I spent most of the night and the next morning with the South Jordan police, worrying, scared, and afraid. So on the 20 minute drive to work that Friday morning, I'm having this conversation with myself about running away from home. It wasn't a new thought, it wasn't a new idea, I was actually daring myself to follow through on it. 
I was in a deep, dark place, living a double life, pretending to be okay at work, at home, at church, with family and friends. But I was anything but okay. I was a mess and had been for a very long time. So just after noon that day, I left my keys and name badge in, in the desk of the store that I managed, in my office, and I told one of my assistant managers I was going to lunch. It was just another lie. I went to four different bank branches and withdrew $10,000 from each one, which was the maximum allowed. I called Marilyn, thinking she probably wasn't home, and she wasn't. I told her I'd be late getting home from work, another lie. And then I went home and packed a very quick bag. <clears throat> I stopped at Walmart to purchase a burner phone and then had lunch at McDonald's. <clears throat> After eating lunch, I got an I-15, headed to Las Vegas, thinking I was pretty clever and finally free. Saturday morning dawned and no word from Chris. I was frantic and didn't know what to do. Vicki, our daughter-in-law's mother and a wonderful friend, came over to be with me and all we could do was wait. And then about 2.45 that afternoon, the phone rang. It was Chris. When I, <clears throat> when I arrived in Las Vegas, I chose to spend the night at a cheap motel on Fremont Street and it was truly a dump perfect reflection of my life. I went down the street to get some dinner and then spent the rest of the night doing some very inappropriate things in some very inappropriate places and spent over $1,000 in the process. I got back to the motel about two in the morning and tried to sleep. But as I lay in my bed, my logical brain kept having a debate with my attic brain and was shooting holes in this whole running away thing. Needless to say, I didn't sleep well at all. I woke up sometime Saturday morning, I have no idea what time it was, and I was sick. Not just a little sick, but the I cannot get out of bed sick. Literally, my head felt like it was in a vice. My stomach was a mess. I had no strength. Thought I was gonna die right there. But I had no reason to be sick, no drugs, no alcohol ever, and I could not figure out what was happening to me. I only knew it was daytime because of the light leaking in around the blackout curtain in the window, and as time passed, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I was stuck. As I lay there suffering, eventually a voice came into my head, called Marilyn. I said, oh no. And that was the first time I thought of her in two days. <clears throat> so the voice came to me again, call Marilyn. And I said, no, no way. So as I lay there a few more minutes, third time the voice told me, call Marilyn. And I knew I had no choice. And I did. I called her on that burner phone, and when she answered, I began to sob. And I just said, I'm sick, and I need help. When I answered the phone from a number I didn't recognize, I thought it might have been the police detective that had been working with me and following up with me. But it was Chris. He was crying and asking for help. I was both relieved and so angry at the same time, and I won't tell you what I said. I asked him where he was, but not very politely. A few hours, oh, I told him not to go anywhere and that I would call him back because I was really worried that he might leave. A few hours later, after a couple more phone calls, Vicki and I were on a plane to Las Vegas to bring him home. When we told... And Vicki's sitting, she's sitting right, right there. there. <laughs> we were like Thelma and Louise. <clears throat> when we told the cab driver where we wanted to go, he said, you sure? And I said, yep, that's where we want to go. It was not a good part of Vegas. When I went into that motel room to get Chris and get his stuff, all I could feel in there was pure evil. I hurried as fast as possible to get him and myself out of there. <clears throat> so after I talked with Marilyn on the phone the third time, she said she would come and get me. I fell into a really, really deep sleep. The next thing I knew, the phone rang and she and Vicki were standing outside the room of the motel. I opened the door, Marilyn 
grabbed my stuff, including a duffel bag full of cash, got me in the back seat of my very small two-door car, curled up in the fetal position, and with Vicky at the wheel, drove me back to Salt Lake through a snowstorm. After a stop at the hospital, where I was told I was depressed, who knew? <laughs> Marilyn and I got home early Sunday morning. After a difficult weekend, more, Monday morning came, and our daughter Kristen found an inpatient rehab center in St. George called Desert Solace. And I found myself once again heading south with Vicki at the wheel a second time. We arrived at Denver Solace about 8.30 Monday night and paid for my 90-day stay in advance with most of the cash that I had taken out of the bank. And my and our recovery began. The three months Chris spent at Desert Solace saved his life physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And it helped save mine and our marriage. I had three months at home without him, communicating only through written letters for the first six weeks before our first family weekend. And I learned to lean on my bishop, my children, my newly found therapist, David Thompson, my friends, and my savior. I soon realized that my own recovery would be as important to me as Chris's was to him. That was the beginning of a new life for both of us. <clears throat> So how and why did this happen? When I was 11 years old, I was sexually abused by an assistant scoutmaster in my church scout troop, which went on for a couple of years. About the same time, my friend and I discovered his dad's porn magazines, and as I like to say, it was the perfect storm. All through my teen years, I craved it, but was able to clean up my act in order to serve a successful LDS church mission. But I never once told my bishop or anyone else about what had happened or what I was doing. And the whole time, I was the golden boy. Good student, senior patrol leader, deacons, teachers, quorum presidents, district and zone leader on my mission, etc. I was great at checking all the boxes. At the same time, I had this secret that I would never share with anyone. Chris and I met when he moved to Santa Monica from Northern California at the beginning of ninth grade. We were friends. We went to school, <clears throat> seminary, and church together. And when he returned home from his mission, we fell in love and were married a few months later. I, don't, I didn't know anything about his porn use, and it was about 25 years later when he finally told me about the abuse he suffered as a young boy, after I had caught, caught him watching porn. Later we talked to our bishop, and he just told Chris to stop it. Sure, that worked. Then he took away his temple recommend. That didn't work either, because at that point, Chris had kind of given up. So from that time on, even though Chris attended some ARP meetings and told me things were better, there was that underlying distrust and lack of real communication I talked about earlier. And when our children became adults and left home, it just got worse. So about five years before my rock bottom, my running away from home, my addiction turned physical. And it became all about strip clubs, massage parlors, and escorts. I was so broken, it's almost impossible to explain, and yet I was a great poser. I was faking life, pretending to be okay at church, at home, at work. I was dying inside. I knew I was going to hell, and I just didn't care. I spent thousands of dollars on sex, destroyed the covenants I had made as a member of the church, and was a liar and a cheat, and it was killing me. I had literally lost my ability to choose and was wrapped in those flaxen cords and chains that we read about in scripture. I know for a fact they are very real. The first time I saw Chris after six weeks at Desert Solace, there was a light in his eyes that I hadn't seen in years. His countenance had changed and it was amazing. We uh, talked all weekend in between activities of the family weekend. For those three months and after, I was able 
to be part of a weekly phone and online me meetings with the wives of Desert Solace, wives whose husbands were there or had graduated. Those phone calls and Zoom meetings have helped in my recovery and have been a huge part of my personal transformation. We picked up Chris, and no, Vicki wasn't there, <laughs> on Friday, March 10th, and he was a new man, and I was a new woman, and we had no idea what was to come in the next seven years. And as Chris likes to repeat from Warrior Boot Camp, we have stepped into the larger life God has for us, and it just keeps expanding and getting better each day and week. If you had told me seven years ago that we would speak in firesides like this one and be serving as addiction recovery missionaries, I would never have believed it. But of course, there have been bumps in the road, difficulties, relapse, suffering, and sadness. It has been those setbacks for us that are just steps for Jesus. Every step, step back and difficulty we have faced on this journey has resulted in new growth and learning only because we didn't quit. The only thing we can do perfectly is to keep going forward and not quit. So here we are, saved by the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ, rescued, redeemed, renewed. There was no reason to be that sick in Las Vegas that morning, but I believe like that lost sheep and like the prodigal, Jesus chased me down and saved me. He followed me into the pit and he pulled me out. He gave me an opportunity to turn around, to see with fresh eyes, to clear my mind and clear my soul and to do the necessary work which he has magnified beyond imagination to change my heart of stone to a heart of flesh. When I returned home on that March 10th, 2017, I was happier than I'd ever been in my life. I learned and experienced so many incredible things in those three short months at Desert Solace. But I had been warned and I was living in a bomb shelter there and that when I left, the bombs would start to fall, and they did. The following weeks and months were so difficult, and sobriety was so much harder than I'd ever imagined. I was going to be that guy that never had a slip, that never relapsed, but that idea was short-lived. I did slip repeatedly, and after about five months, suffered a relapse that actually cost me my job. But I didn't quit, and thankfully, Marilyn didn't quit on me. I lost my membership in this church and was rebaptized. I lost my temple blessings and covenants, but had them restored. I had experienced forgiveness in unimaginable ways, and I am so grateful for that. And for a savior who did not quit on me, even when in addiction, I had definitely quit on him. So we would like to quickly share with you some of the principles and some experiences that have worked and helped us in our continuing recovery path. And it is a path, not a freeway. That is not, nor it has ever been, a path without work to do to clear it. There are fallen trees, rocks in the way, really big hills to climb, and valleys that are deeper sometimes than we would like. But this one thing we know, God has put people in our path to guide us along, to push us when necessary, and to lead us as well. Beginning with Mark and Jerry Jorgensen, the owners of Desert Solace, Lynn Clark Brunson, a spiritful and wonderful therapist and counselor, Shane Scott, the life coach who invited us constantly to dig deep and get our pain out into the universe, and David Thompson, our incredible therapist at Adult Recovery in Linden, who can listen with empathy while holding us accountable to our stuff. And so many more we have encountered and loved and learned from our recovery journey. That list is so long. So let's quickly discuss some of what we have learned and experienced. Recovery always begins with a choice. It can't be forced on us. It never works when we're shamed into it. 
Real lasting recovery always comes from a place deep within ourselves. When we finally realize the hell we've created and we feel this intense desire to get out of it. Remember when Nephi wanted to see the dream that his dad had? Nephi says he desired to see what his father had seen. He believed that the Lord could make that happen. And then he sat pondering in his heart. Then the spirit shows up. And the first thing he says to Nephi is, Behold, what desirest thou? What do you want? What do you really want? He already knows the answer, but he wants to hear it from Nephi. That's the question that needs to be answered as we begin and as we continue in recovery. What do I want? How badly do I want it? And what am I willing to do to get it? I certainly didn't have a clear picture of what real recovery would or could look like for me in those first few days at Desert Solace. But I knew I wanted to get fixed, and I knew this was my opportunity, and I'd better not blow it. So I was all in from day one. And since then, I've learned that intention, belief, pondering, and work can move me forward in ways I can't see or imagine. Recovery always begins and continues with intention, desire, and choice. Recovery will only work as we live in awareness, with our eyes open. Looking back, we realized we had been living much of our life very unconsciously, just going through the motions, just trying to get through each day, while trying so hard to avoid any pain, difficulty, or hard conversations around what was really going on. Neither of us was truly ever aware of our choices, nor did we want to be. But real continuing recovery requires awareness. It requires us to live life consciously and for us to make choices every day, all day, that are within the boundaries that we set for ourselves and those set for us by a loving God. We have the opportunity to see things as they really are, even if we still see through a glass darkly, as Paul says. This requires us to constantly be aware of what we are listening to, what we're watching, what we're thinking, what we're feeling, and what we're saying to ourselves and others. It requires us to get very real and very honest with ourselves and others and doesn't allow for the excuses and the gaslighting we lived with in addiction. It doesn't allow us to live as victims and to continue giving away our power to the adversary or to anyone else. It definitely means that as a wife and a support person, I am no longer a victim or a doormat, and I have been able to regain and reclaim my own power given to me by God. It asks us to be authentic and to be willing to be vulnerable, and that is such a hard thing to do. Our addict brain will fight against that constantly, but it's a battle we can win with practice and help from others. And like all of this, it's always a choice. <clears throat> From almost my first day at Desert Solace, I was told that I could let go of my past, let go of my false beliefs about myself, about God, really about everything. What? That was news to me. I had no clue how to do that or what that even looked like. How do I do that? I had spent most of my life living in the past and worrying about the future while believing so many lies about myself, that I wasn't good enough, strong enough, or just wasn't simply enough. I got to learn how to really live in the present, and I practiced that every day. But once I realized that it was not just a possibility, but could actually be a new way to live, I was excited to embrace it. The past is the past. It cannot be changed whether it was five minutes ago or five years ago. All we can do with the past is to learn from it and then keep moving forward. As we keep living in this awareness in the present moment, we can realize that it's all we have and the future, even tomorrow, is not guaranteed, never is. It does take some practice though. We now realize that our past, choices that worked, and those that certainly didn't, was not an accident. 
we've learned that there are no accidents because all of it, good and bad, easy and hard, light and darkness, all of it got us here today in this meeting. This is where we are supposed to be because we are here. Our experiences shape us and our suffering defines us. No accidents. The past is just the past. We learn from it and let it go. It doesn't serve us to carry that heavy baggage around with us. Yes, there are no accidents. Right now, some of you are thinking, well, that's crazy talk. But Chris is right. The past cannot be changed, and the future is not guaranteed. It is what it is. We either live a life of acceptance or we live a life of resistance, and a life of resistance is miserable. In October 2017, Women's Session of General Conference, Sister Joy D. Jones gave a message called Value Beyond Measure. As we watched it together, and when she closed with Amen, Chris and I looked at each other and we were both in tears. It touched us deeply. Chris told me he wanted to send Sister Jones a letter and, or an email telling her how much we loved her talk. The following Sunday, he read her talk again, cried again, and told me again how he wanted to let her know the impact on both of us. The next day, Sunday, we were invited to our daughter Kristen's ward in West Jordan for the primary program our grandchildren would be singing in. As we sat in the chapel before the meeting, their bishop left the stand, walked by us, and spoke to someone sitting right behind us. I turned to Chris and said, I think that's Sister Jones. It was. So as soon as the meeting ended, he turned around and was able to tell Sister Jones in person how there were no accidents, and she replied, we say that all the time. So just a coincidence? Of all the wards she could have visited, as the primary general president, she chose a random ward in West Jordan and sat in the pew directly behind us. There are no accidents. So when we talk about our past, it was not an accident. It all happened as it did, and it got us here tonight, at this pulpit, in this meeting, with you. Without our past, as ugly and painful as it might be, we may have not had the opportunity to be here with you and to, and to experience the Savior's grace and atonement as deeply as we have. So I'd like to briefly share three experiences all around repentance and forgiveness. So as some of you have heard me say, especially if you've been in uh, one of our 12-step meetings, Growing up in the church, repentance always sounded heavy and difficult to me. Certainly no fun. I didn't get it. And I just assumed there was really no hope for me at all. So at Desert Solace, we had a yoga session twice a week with our amazing and very spiritful teacher, Miriam, who I came to love. And I was not good at yoga. Stiff old man. <clears throat> But at the beginning of each session, we choose from a deck of intention cards. And that card we chose would be our focus during that yoga session. A few weeks into my time there, I picked a card about forgiveness. I had been so concerned about this. How could I ever be forgiven? How could I forgive myself? At that point in my recovery, I had no idea if Marilyn was going to ever forgive me. So that was my focus. At the end of each yoga session, we would practice Shavasana, lying still while gentle music played, and Miriam would talk quietly or quote some scripture. And the real challenge of Shavasana, if you've ever done yoga, is simply to stay awake, right? <clears throat> As I lay there that day, eyes closed, focused on forgiveness, I felt what seemed like warm water washing over me. And I knew at that moment I was being forgiven by God. And I knew instinctively that as he was forgiving me, I could forgive myself. It's so hard to describe, but it was so real. And I'll never forget it. 
and I felt so much better afterward. Another day, as I, as I was doing personal study in my notebook, so much of what I had done came flooding back to me, my mind. I didn't even want to think about it, though. You know, I wanted to forget the past, but I had to be reminded of the past as I was doing this exercise. That night, once again, those things from my past hit me like a ton of bricks, and my prayer that night was just tears. I cried myself to sleep. The next morning, I was still feeling the weight of it, so I talked to Lynn, our therapist and counselor. Lynn's the most amazing person I maybe have ever met in my life, and she was 80 years old at the time, and just the wisest, most beautiful person I've known. I explained that I wasn't really feeling guilt or shame, but I was just so sad about what I had done to Marilyn, my family, and my friends. And Lynn just sat there and smiled. And she said, godly sorrow. And she was so excited about how bad I felt. <laughs> but then I got it. That kind of sorrow is not the same as guilt or shame because those are all about me. This was about the people I loved and it hurt so badly. And it was something that I was required to feel. When I got home, I confessed to my bishop right away. Bishop Barton sitting in the back row tonight. Before Desert Solace, I was determined to never, ever tell a soul about the darkness I lived in and all the things that I had done. But now I was excited to make it right with the church. And Bishop Barton was amazing. He just listened to me and he loved me. No judgment, no chastisement, no disappointment. After Marilyn and I had multiple meetings with President Stevens, who was at the time our state president, we had an early Sunday morning date to meet with the High Council. We didn't know it then, but that morning would be one of the great experiences of our life. Marilyn, Bishop Barton, and I were invited into the High Council room, and they were singing a quiet hymn. I knew just two or three of those brothers, but I was not afraid at all. And the spirit was like a warm blanket over all of us. After introductions, I was invited to share my story with all of them. It took me about half hour, 30, 40 minutes. There were a few questions, but once again, no judgment, no, no condemnation, just love. After sharing, I felt so much lighter and better than I had before. After we were done, and I was told that my membership in the church was taking, being taken away from me, and what the restrictions would be for the unknown future, I went around that table and hugged every one of those brothers. Pure love. I understood then that the church has boundaries, and I would broken them in a big way. So this was in no way a punishment. This was the path toward a fresh start and a new beginning, and it felt great. But all of this asked for continued repentance. Just like grace, repentance is not God's backup plan. It is the plan and is a giant piece of continuing long-term recovery because it never stops. As Kurt Frankham wrote, repentance isn't just a nice side program to be used when needed, as if it were a fire extinguisher behind glass that is used only during spiritual emergencies. <clears throat> Living in repentance is the gospel, and it is recovery. The Savior 70 times seven doesn't just apply to us. It applies to him as well. There is no end to his forgiveness. I've learned that the Savior wants nothing more than to forgive us, to heal us, and to shower us with grace and with mercy. Don't be afraid to seek forgiveness from Jesus or from church leaders. The question I'm asked most often is, how did you forgive Chris? He lied, he cheated, and he ran away from you and your family. How do you forgive that? 
It says in the Addiction Recovery Family Support Guide, part of the process of offering forgiveness is letting go of the burdens that keep us from experiencing the Savior's peace. We find healing as we forgive others. We don't excuse that behavior, but forgiveness helped me move forward with my life. The love of my Heavenly Father and my Savior helped me to see Chris as they did, as a broken son of God. Forgiveness did not happen overnight. I knew I had to be patient with myself as I worked through the process. At the time, we had been married for 40 plus years, and I wanted to think things through carefully and not make any quick decisions. I had a lot invested in this marriage. Learning to rebuild trust was also a process that didn't happen quickly. I, wanted, I watched Chris begin to change in his willingness to be honest and communicate with me. He was showing up differently, even if it wasn't perfect. He demonstrated to me through his actions that he wanted to change. He wanted to draw closer to God, and he was working hard to make that change happen. This was, once again, a slow, gradual process that changed my heart and his. But trust and forgiveness are not the same thing. We can choose to forgive, and still the work of trusting again may take much longer and be more difficult. We were both willing to do our parts to rebuild the trust that had been broken and damaged so badly. Recovery doesn't happen in a vacuum, and it doesn't work alone. It requires connection and community. Each of our stories has great power, and yours does too. As we share our stories with others, we can reap that power and store it up as strength to keep going. Chris and I began to attend meetings together right after he got home from St. George. And about six years ago, we discovered a brand new couples meeting being held in Sandy, so we went. We loved it right away. I loved it because I was able to sit in the same room with other wives and their husbands and better understand that I wasn't alone in this. And husbands had the opportunity to also hear from other wives and come to grips with the wreckage that not only they but others had caused their spouses. There was a spirit and a power in that meeting we haven't felt before, and we attended every week. Christian and Kelly Smith, who led that meeting from its infancy, were amazing. Well, now we're missionaries who, along with our dear friends Matt and Tracy Larson, get to lead the couple's meeting every Thursday night. Never in my wildest dreams did I see us doing something like this. But Chris always talks about stepping into the larger story that God has for us, and I know this is a big part of that. Every Thursday driving home after our meeting, I tell Chris that was the best meeting ever, because it is. And now, I don't even, I just say, do you want me to say it? Every night we get in the car on Thursday, do you want me to say it? Yes, okay, this was the best meeting ever. <laughs> so attend meetings. At Desert Solace, Chris attended 12-step meetings every night for 90 days, and it was a huge boost in his early recovery. We can't ever imagine not attending meetings because we both need and treasure the recovery community we're in. We have dozens of people we have met and we love in this community, and they are such a blessing in our lives. The other community we love and need so much are the brothers and sisters we attend church with on Sundays. Like recovery, salvation doesn't happen in a vacuum. We can only do it together, and we have discovered that attending church is not just something we need, but as we go not only as consumers, but as participants and contributors, church attendance has new life. We've learned that the Spirit is always there in every meeting. When we go with the intention and attend with awareness and focus, church attendance means more to us now than it ever did before Chris's rock bottom because we go with a purpose and with joy, not because we have to. So just a few, to a few tools we've been able to use in our recovery journey. Slow down. Recovery requires some routine and rhythm. Take time every morning for what we call your dailies. Music, scripture, devotionals, podcasts, meditation, 
prayer to connect with God and to set the intention for the day. Change it up. It doesn't have to be the same every morning, but we cannot afford to skip this any day if we want continued sobriety and recovery. Don't confuse sobriety with recovery. Sobriety is a huge part of recovery, obviously, but they are not the same thing. The recovery path is how you live your life, both inwardly and outwardly. It is a change of heart, <clears throat> not just a change of behavior. And once again requires focus, intention, keeping your word, honoring your word, vulnerability, connection with God and people, and a lot of work. The only way to live in continuing recovery is to do the work required, meetings, maybe therapy, study, and more, and then allow Jesus to make more out of it and to make more out of you. When he fed the 5,000, someone had to bake the bread, someone had to catch the fish, and the boy had to bring it to the sermon. And then Jesus took a little and made a lot out of it with more to spare. Only he can do that with our recovery. Self-care. Take care of your physical self. Exercise. Go to bed earlier. Get up earlier. Eat better. Maybe eat less. Take walks. Hike. Spend time in nature. We took a couple of hikes every week at Dutch Solace and went to the rec center every single day. We must show ourselves respect if we're going to successfully learn to love ourselves. God and other people, recovery works better when we feel better physically. Find an accountability partner, a mentor or a sponsor, someone you trust and will be honest with, someone who will hold you accountable but will also support you as you move along the path. Once again, recovery does not succeed alone. Find that person. Set boundaries and do your best to live within them. We have had so many discussions about boundaries in our couples meeting because they are important for safety and recovery for both the addict and the spouse. Honestly, before recovery, I had no boundaries. I really didn't know what the word really meant. But on the final family weekend at Desert Solace, just a week before Chris was to come home, he and I met with Ryan, who was the clinical director at the time, to discuss what our boundaries would look like in the coming weeks and months. Prior to that, Chris and I were both asked to separately think about them and then write them down. For him, what would keep him safe and sober? For me, what would keep, help keep him safe and sober and me safe? And in addition, what would the possible consequences be if a boundary was broken? Surprisingly enough, when we, walked, we talked about this together, our boundaries were almost the same. And it wasn't a difficult process to agree on them. Why? Because Chris was fully invested in his upcoming sobriety and recovery. And we were both pretty well knew that situations that had enabled much of his poor behavior over the past years, did this work out perfectly? No, but it's something we navigated together and once again came down to the choices made by both Chris and myself and the determination to keep moving forward. Boundaries work better when they can be agreed upon and when the consequence fits the boundary. They work best when accompanied by some grace. But a boundary can also be set by a spouse even without the consent of the addict just to keep her safe. Boundaries remove the feelings of being a victim to your own behavior or to someone else's. They are a critical part of recovery, whether you're married, single, living with parents, or anyone else. We have learned for ourselves just how important they are. Don't be afraid to set boundaries. Words have power. Abusive self-talk is crippling, and as an addict, I said things to myself that I would never, ever say to another person. I couldn't be that mean to somebody else. I've actually come to realize that I'm not an idiot, and I'm not a loser. Who knew? For so many years, there was this feeling of self-disappointment and anger inside of me, and it just simmered there all the time. I've learned to be gentle with myself and to give myself grace when needed, 
I've learned to ask for help when I need it, whether with recovery or with a broken water heater. At Desert Solace, an equine therapy twice a week, I heard Julie, our therapist, tell, tell us so many times, let go of the expectations, let go of the how, be open to all possibilities. How often do you go to a movie because it got great reviews or your friend loved it, and then you came away disappointed? We so often in life do the same thing with everything. We go to work with an expectation of what the day will be like, and, and, we, and when it doesn't turn out that way, we get frustrated, we're disappointed. We go to church with an expectation. Maybe the speakers aren't that great, or, well, that list is endless. <laughs> but we seem to live with constant disappointment. I've learned to let go of the expectations and just have the experience. Shane Scott, our life coach at Desert Solace, often said that life is not to be understood, just experienced. At work, every time something was asked of me by my bosses or the company, my first reaction would be, how? And then I'd make up a story about how it couldn't be done and all the reasons why not. So let go of the how. Just step into what life is giving us and stop making up stories about anything and everything. Only then can we really be open to all possibilities and not cut ourselves off from every option available to us. Make choices, not decisions. There's a big difference between the two. For most of my life, I lived the life of have to. I had to go to school, I had to go to church, I had to go to the store, I had to go to the dentist. Had to, had to, had to. It was always kind of heavy and not a lot of fun. But in recovery, we've discovered that we can flip the script and choose something different. And it is a choice that takes intention and practice. We choose to live a life of get to. I get to go to work. I get to do my ministry. I get to visit my neighbor. And on and on and on. This has been a huge shift for both of us and allows us to focus on how grateful we feel for those opportunities because they, in fact, have become opportunities for us instead of responsibilities and duties. It has become or has changed our connection with God and with other people, and it is a much better way to live. It has opened our eyes to all that we are blessed with. So if you're familiar with Lehi's dream in the first book of Nephi, <clears throat> He begins that dream in a wilderness, a wasteland. And even with a guide, he wanders around it for the space of many hours, long time. And then he stops to pray, to finally ask for help. And guess what? He gets it. It's then that he sees this incredibly beautiful tree with some amazingly delicious fruit that we now know represents the love of God. I spent some serious time in that wasteland, a good chunk of my life. Maybe you have too. But as Toby Max sings, help is on the way. That tree is still there, and that fruit is there for every one of us. It never runs out. Recovery like life requires work and effort on our part. So we get to do everything we've talked about tonight and more, but above, above all else, we get to as Leanne said in our meeting a few weeks ago, we get to load up on Jesus. I love that. Load up on Jesus. <laughs> Bob Goff wrote that Jesus don't, doesn't want to be our study project. So this is not about learning about him. This is about leaning into him. This is about allowing him in to heal us. This is about relationship with him. He wants all of me, not just the Sunday part of me. He wants the real me, the vulnerable, I can't do this myself, me. Before rehab, I listened to sports talk radio in my car most of the time. After I got home, I realized what a waste of time that was and searched for something better. What am I going to listen to now? God led me to the message on Sirius XM and K-Love on FM radio. 
And I have fallen in love with contemporary Christian music, or as Marilyn calls it, Jesus music. These artists are incredibly talented and inspired, and their music has helped change my life and has strengthened my recovery. <clears throat> More than once, when I first heard a song like I Can Only Imagine by Mercy Me or He Knows My Name by Francesca Battistelli, I really had to pull the car over because I was crying too hard to keep driving. That music helps me to load up on Jesus every day. Addiction is always trying to fill a hole in our heart, the I'm not enough or the I don't have what it takes. Only Jesus Christ can fill that hole and answer that question for us. As we leave our addictive behaviors behind, we're left with time on our hands, kind of like a vacuum. We must intentionally fill that void and fill that time, and those are some of the big choices we get to make every single day. Once again, load up on Jesus and dive into the work of intentional living and recovery. The Savior has taken our weaknesses and turned them into strengths. How? Well, it tells us in Ether 12:27, my grace is sufficient. That's it. It's his grace. Grace is not fluff, some fluffy, feel-good idea that Christians like to talk about. No, grace is gritty, tough, strong, resilient, and will come to you wherever you may be. Jesus' grace chased me down to Las Vegas and brought me home, even when I wasn't looking for it and I was running from it. But he gave me the opportunity to change, to transform my life, he offered me a huge second chance. Why? Just because he loves me. I know now that he loved me in the middle of my darkest, addictive, acting out, covenant breaking days. And he loves me the same now. I do not in any way need to earn his love. And when John wrote that God is love, he wasn't kidding. He loved me enough to make a way for me to come home and to magnify my efforts enough to allow me to stand here tonight. Is it all perfect, rainbows and skittles? Of course not. But I've learned that God doesn't love me because he wants something from me. He loves me because he has something for me. And now, as Philip Yancey says, I get to choose every day to live in the grace of the day. I get to choose peace and gratitude and connection and joy and above all else, love. So I had three months to decide while Chris was at Desert Solace to figure out my life and what it was gonna look like going forward. I knew choices had to be made, but I could not fix this myself. I was broken and had to discover for myself if God and Jesus Christ were really there and could help me. I knew I had to make me better work on my recovery. I really had no idea how to do this, but little by little, with a lot of help from some wonderful people, I began to heal, grow, and recover. I learned that I am not responsible for Chris's recovery, but only my own, but that we could do this together. I prayed to know where to start. I read in the sixth section of Doctrine and Covenants, look unto me in every thought, doubt not, fear not. Jesus wasn't the one who had the doubt, it was me. As soon as I realized that he was the only one that could help me, so much opened up for me. My relationship with God became sweet and fulfilling. The scriptures were a comfort to me as I sought answers. Church attendance, partaking of the sacrament, and attending church classes were a blessing to me. Prayers became a delight for me as I talked honestly with my Heavenly Father for maybe the first time in my life. I was open to the Spirit. I have learned so much about myself, the gospel, life, and the infinite love of my Heavenly Father for me than in all the previous years of my life. Our adult children and grandchildren have changed so much if they have experienced the recovery of their father and grandpa and have been able to have so many honest conversations about those flax and cords Chris talked about and how Jesus can work in our lives in ways not imagined. The Thursday night couples ARP meeting has helped my continued recovery in ways I can't describe. We love each person there as if they were a part of our family. We love listening to their stories of their ups and downs of recovery and life. 
We cheer for them, we pray for them, and we feed on their spirit of honesty and vulnerability and love. They are a huge source of strength for both of us. I have been blessed with good supportive church leaders, awesome ward members. We worship with wonderful friends and especially our amazing family. People think I'm crazy, but I wouldn't trade the experience and lessons learned because of our difficult and yes, often painful journey. I wouldn't recommend it, but we wouldn't be here with you tonight without it. I am grateful for it. So I am forever grateful that my Savior chased me, stopped in my tracks, brought me home, saved me from the hell that I had created. He's blessed both of us with so many people who bring light into our lives and joy to our souls. His atonement and grace have provided the necessarily, necessary healing for both of us on this path of recovery. And we can, in fact, sing the song of redeeming love. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Elder and Sister Epson. Um, we'll go ahead and invite Brother Brown to come forward to give some closing remarks. After uh, his remarks, we will have our closing hymn, one verse of number 193, I Stand All Amazed, after which we'll have a closing prayer by Kristen Bowler. <laughs> um, and then following the closing prayer, um, as we normally do, we'll have a question and answer session. Thank you. Good evening, brothers and sisters. It's wonderful to be with you. and Thank you to the Epsons for such candid and honest and faith-filled messages and for, for being willing to share the, the details of their life and the details of their um, recovery and of the, the way that the Savior has intervened with them. just want to bring two or three things to your attention. Um, one, as was mentioned, we do this fireside every month, and as you, if you exit at this side, uh, there's a flyer there with the details of, of next month's fireside. We encourage you to take that and, and uh, to join us here again uh, for the, these faith-filled and spiritual experiences that we have each month. Also, we'd remind you of the uh, recovery meetings happening tonight at 730 uh, down the hallway here on this side to the right is a, a recovery meeting uh, for those who are struggling with the addic with addiction to the left is a family support meeting those again start at 7 30 this afternoon final thing there's also just on the table outside a, uh, a one of our pink sheets which is a schedule for all of the recovery meetings that we host in the sandy draper area so we encourage you to pick one of those up as well so that you have that information and then I just wanted to share very, very briefly my testimony of Jesus Christ, of his resurrection, of his power, uh, of his perfect justice, and also of his perfect mercy, and that love that comes with those things. And that, that power uh, has the, the ability to transform us, as we have heard uh, Elder and Sister Epson testify of tonight through the darkest, deepest challenges in our lives. And I have felt that power in my life, and I am grateful for it. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Father, we are sitting here in gratitude tonight um, for the love that we feel from you. And we're especially grateful for the redeeming power of Jesus Christ in our lives. Um, especially on this Palm Sunday as we focus more on the last week of his life and the great atoning sacrifice that he made for each of us individually. And we're so thankful for the addiction recovery program and the tools that it gives us to help us to heal the wounds that we have, to heal our hearts, and to keep us in a life of repentance and receiving from forgiveness from thee. We're grateful for those who are in a place and willing to share their stories and the things that we learn from each other as we are on this journey together. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Chris and Marilyn, if you'll step up here. I want to thank you again for uh, sh being willing to, to share your story and, and for being so thorough in your, in your comments and remarks. Um, uh, I had some questions at the beginning, and you answered them it. for me. <laughs> so, um, but I'm guessing that there uh, are still some lingering questions. Um, we've got a couple of microphones. Um, so we can, uh, if anybody has questions, just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Um, and you can, thanks, and you can ask uh, Chris or Marilyn or both of them. Um, and then for those of you who are, have joined us online, uh, you're welcome to submit your questions through the chat. And um, Blake will um, be the mouth of, for those questions uh, for Mar uh, Chris and Marilyn. All right, so we've got a question right here. Get a microphone. Thank you. It should be on. I can speak really loud. Perfect. People online can't hear you, so our audio tech. Yeah. Technology, it's lovely, I love it, when it works. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Go, Casey. Marilyn, this question is for you. In my first conversation with Chris, he s said something that he reiterated tonight, and that was recovery is about a change of heart, not about a change of behavior. Was there a specific point when you had that aha, aha moment where, where you witnessed that not just change in behavior, but that change of heart? And what was that moment, or how do you describe that? Well, I don't want to make it sound like it was, um, you know, trivial, but Chris used, you know, he used to always do little things for me. Um, but when, when he, we'd have an argument or whatever, and he'd say, well, I bring home a paycheck, or I empty the dishwasher, or I you know, do this or that. Um, but when I started noticing him doing maybe just uh, above and beyond things, that um, he was just so considerate and kind, and not that he was horrible before, but those things just didn't cross his mind. I think his mind was where it shouldn't have been. And so, I don't know if I can pinpoint one thing, but I mean, always, you know, it, for telling me where he was going and what he would be doing, which is what he never did before. And so just the little things like that just made me think he really is thinking in his heart I really would like to know those things. I want to know because, 
you know, for a while there, it was when he'd go to do something or be somewhere, I would never really know if that's where he was going. Because for years, he would tell me lies. So I think just those kind of things, just the little things that you don't hardly even recognize sometimes, is what he did. And I just noticed his heart changing. Does that make any sense? <laughs> Along, Casey, along those lines, maybe you and I talked about it, but in rehab we talked about showing up differently. And that she would never trust me, she would never have that aha moment if I didn't show up differently for her every day. Actually talk with her because as an addict, I don't want to talk about anything at all. Like, she'd tell me how her day at work was. How was your day? And I, I was like a fifth grader. That was fine. And your mom asked you, how was school? That was fine. <laughs> how, was, how was church? We talked about Jesus. I mean, you know, this, this was where I was. And so all of a sudden, we're having conversations, and which was different and interesting. Uh, monumental. Monumental. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, we've talked about this, but, you know, showing, all I could do was show up differently. And once again, we talked about, I learned about keeping my word and honoring my word. Keeping my word is if I say I'm going to be home from work at 6.30, I'm home from work at 6.30. Honoring my word is if I have a flat tire on the freeway, I make a phone call and say, hey, I'm going to be late, I got a flat tire on the freeway. But keeping and honoring my word was, once again, a huge step, because we know that addicts do neither one of those. <clears throat> Lie very consistently. <laughs> that, was, that was a big deal as well. Just like, check, check. We hear so much about the hole in the soul and the loss of your dignity. What was the thing that really helped you, Chris, to start to feel you're sort of getting some dignity back where you could actually start to feel some love for yourself? Well, I mean, I had the incredible advantage of spending 90 days in rehab with some amazing counselors and therapists and people. I was, you know, as I said about Shane Scott, who's the program director at Desert Solace, and he's a life coach. I mean, he, he would force us to dig deep. So he would, he would ask any of us in our group a question, and, you know, we'd sit there and go, mm, I don't know. And he would just stare at us. There was no letting us off the hook. We had to dig deep. And as I started to dig deep, I started to understand myself more. It was a combination of things. Uh, I mentioned equine therapy. I don't know if anyone's familiar with equine therapy. It is not riding horses. It is basically trying to get a horse to do something it is not interested in doing. Sometimes you cannot even speak to the horse. Sometimes you cannot touch the horse. But horses sense your energy in an amazing way. And they know if you're full of fear or if you're full of confidence. They know if you're happy or if you're sad. They know that. I've, I've experienced it. I've seen it. The point is, equine twice a week for three months, I learned more about myself and my energy and the energy I put out into the universe than really anything else we did. And that might sound, sound kind of weird to some of you, but it's, it's, a, it's a thing. It's true. Um, <clears throat> but I, I discovered, you know, I mean, my personal story is, and I found out much of this after I got home, actually, opted as a child. Uh, but what I didn't know was that my mother, my birth mother, had me, took me from the hospital, brought me back three days later, and, and left me for adoption. 
and then I was in foster care for two months before I was adopted by my parents. I didn't even know that until about six years ago. But the point is, as, as Lynn would point out, all these things that happen to us, even as babies, can profoundly affect us subconsciously and, and determine how we feel about ourselves later in life. And I, I, you know, the fact that my father abandoned us when I was a sophomore in high school and left my mom for another woman. I think I would have learned, right? <laughs> But I didn't. We, we tend to repeat these generational behaviors over and over and over. The point is, we all have little T traumas. We all have big T traumas in our life. That's, that's what we have to I had to find out, at least. All I, all I, can, all I know is what I experienced. And as I discovered those things about myself and I was able to draw closer to the Lord, he did. He started filling that hole. And, and I was able to just let go of this stuff. It's like, guess what? Doesn't matter. I'm okay. And Lynn, who our, our beloved therapist, she would look at, at, at me every day. Each one of us, she said, you're perfect just the way you are. First time I heard that, I thought, you are nuts, lady. <laughs> but she kept saying it, and I started to believe it, and now I do believe it. We're perfect just the way we are, but we have an opportunity to be more perfect tomorrow or next week. We don't settle for it. But the point is that we are God's children, and he loves us. Period. We have a question online. Thanks, Blake. We do. Uh, it asks, they ask, how would you suggest we support those at the beginning of their road to recovery? And what would have been or what was helpful for both of you individually and collectively? And we want to wrap up in about two or three minutes, so. Okay. okay. Then maybe you should answer. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> All I can say is just love them. I mean, I know that's the Sunday school answer, maybe. You know, I mean, there, there's work to do, right? 12-step meetings, maybe find a good therapist, find a support person, find a sponsor. Um, there are books, there are podcasts, there are, there are so many resources available, no matter the addiction, no matter where you are. There's so many resources, but you, the, you have to be willing. I had to be willing to access the resources. You know, it's the old, you lead the horse to water thing, right? Um, I was never willing to drink before my rock bottom. And now it's like I'm drinking every day. So <laughs> never stops because it's fun and I love it. But really above all, you just love, love them. You want to say anything? Why well, sure. Like, got 30 seconds. Um, for me, um, I talked about a little bit about that first um, couples meeting that we went to. I was really discouraged because I had been to other meetings and we would separate to go to our different meetings and I always felt bad because I kind of wanted to hear what he, they were talking about as well as what we were talking about. And so when we found that couples meeting, I immediately found so much love there that I just wanted to go back again. And I feel like when those new couples, or it doesn't matter, or any of the ones that just keep coming back to our couples meeting, um, I just want, and I do, throw my arms around them and just love them. And I notice usually first-time wives will always be very emotional. And I can see it all the way through the meeting. And at the end, I just can't wait to hug them and tell them, it's going to be okay. I know exactly how you feel. Please keep coming back. And it's just the best feeling in the whole world. So I think just, just love, and that's what's worked 
for us and that's what seems to work for others. And Jesus' music. He's got me converted. <laughs> Want to do one more question? We got, I think we have one right here. Um, Blake, is that mic on? It is now. Is the mic on? Oh, you can hear me? Yeah. Um, during your transgressions um, at the beginning, um, did you ever doubt that Heavenly Father would not forgive you? Short answer is yes. <clears throat> so here's what's crazy. So growing up in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, right, we always talk about testimony. I had a testimony. I believed he was there. And I never lost that. In the, in the middle of my darkest days, and they were dark, trust me, I didn't lose my testimony. I knew God was there. I just thought he was disappointed at me, angry at me, and as I said, I really honestly thought, I'm going to hell, and there's not a thing I can do about it because I can't stop. Part of me didn't want to stop. Part of me wanted to stop, but I couldn't stop. And so I just said, I'm going to hell, whatever that looks like, and I had given up. So did I think he would forgive me? Didn't even cross my mind. Honestly, at that point in my life, I didn't think so. Now, obviously, when I began my recovery, that became a concern. I needed some forgiveness, and I, I was able to find it. And I think we all can find it. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thanks again, Epsons for being here and sharing your story. And thanks everyone for, for being here and participating. Hope you have a great night. We got a meeting starting in a, in a minute. So thanks for coming.